Good morning. Previously, we've talked about how to get the differential equations that a test particle, either massive or massless, has to follow in the Schwarzschild geometry. These differential equations look a great deal like the Newtonian equations. We have previously seen that the solutions of this will be u equal gm over h squared plus a constant times cosine theta plus another constant times sine of theta. If we set up our coordinate system so that the perihelion, the closest point in the orbit to the origin, is at theta equals zero, that simplifies considerably. In what follows, we will assume that we've done that already. After a great deal of thinking and effort, we figured out the Einstein field equations. We solved them in the case where you have spherical symmetry. We asked ourselves, for a massive particle, are there any solutions to this that lie in the surface where phi is equal to pi over 2? The answer turned out to be yes. In fact, the equation that we get is practically identical to the Newtonian case, the only difference being the 3gm over c squared term. In the case of a photon, we were also able to get the equation of motion. Today, I want to primarily think of the Newtonian case and the massive particle case. If we investigate the photon case, it turns out to be similar and in some ways easier. For illustrative purposes, I'm going to think of the Newtonian case. I want to start with this because I know what the exact solution to such a thing is supposed to be. If I write a computer program to approximate these solutions, I'll be able to tell you how well the approximate solution is doing. In any second order differential equations, typically there are two variable parameters in the solutions, in this case alpha and beta, which are necessary to select a particular solution out of the set of all possible solutions. The Newtonian orbit is second derivative of u with respect to theta plus u equal a constant, which I'm just going to call a for our purposes at the moment. The solutions of that differential equation are easy to get. The alpha and the beta are constants. For an elliptical orbit, the r coordinate will take on a minimum value at what's called its perihelion. I'm going to set my coordinate system up so that r becomes minimal when theta is zero. u is the reciprocal of r, so u must be maximal at theta equals zero, which immediately tells me two things. Firstly, the derivative of u with respect to theta must be zero when theta is zero. Also, the second derivative of u must be negative at theta equals zero, so that the graph of u versus theta is concave down at that point, and I get a maximum. Putting these two facts into the solution, I find out that firstly, beta has to be zero. Secondly, I find out that negative alpha must be negative, so alpha must be positive. That tells me that u is this positive constant a, gm over h squared in terms of the physics, plus a positive number times cosine theta. If I factor the a out and call alpha divided by a, which is positive, by the letter epsilon, the eccentricity of the orbit, I can write r, which is 1 over u, 1 over a times 1 plus epsilon cosine theta as this form, 
or if it's convenient as a constant divided by 1 plus epsilon cosine theta. This is the usual form that people write these kind of equations in. Not to insult anyone's intelligence, I want to do a set of very simple calculations that will relate the constants B, the eccentricity, epsilon, and things that you could actually measure from the orbit from this equation. I can see that R is going to be minimal when 1 plus epsilon cosine theta is as big as you can make it. That will be when cosine of theta is 1. That will be when theta is 0. So the smallest possible R value is this constant B divided by 1 plus the eccentricity. On the other hand, if I want to make R as big as possible, I want to make 1 plus epsilon cosine theta as small as possible. The smallest that cosine ever gets is negative 1, which happens when theta is equal to pi. So the maximum R value is that same constant B divided by 1 minus epsilon. Not to insult anyone's intelligence, but take the ratio R max over R min. The B's cancel out, giving you 1 plus epsilon over 1 minus epsilon. Multiply both sides by 1 minus epsilon. Expand. Add epsilon R max to both sides. Subtract R min from both sides. Factor the epsilon out. Divide through by R max plus R min, and you obtain this result. If I tell you the biggest and smallest value of the R coordinate, then I automatically know the value of epsilon. On the other hand, returning to this formula, if I know R max and R min, I can calculate the epsilon, and this immediately tells me that B is R min times 1 plus the eccentricity. Likewise, I can take this formula, and it turns out that B is R max times 1 minus the eccentricity. In what follows, I'm going to feel free to use these results at will. If we didn't know how to solve that differential equation, though, we would be faced with this issue second derivative of u with respect to theta plus u is some constant, or more generally, some formula that might have theta and u in it some way, or even du d theta. We do know that u, when theta equals zero, is supposed to be one over the minimal r value, so we do know that. And because of the way that we've turned our coordinate axis, the derivative of u, which is a multiple of the derivative of r, must be 0 when theta is equal to 0. I'm going to create a vector in the linear algebra sense of the word, y. y is going to have two components, y1 and y2. Notice that I'm not going to be doing the kind of manipulations we do in ordinary tensor calculus. So y1 and y2 are just number functions. I could write the index upstairs or downstairs, or as I'll do in my computer code, write it on the same line as y, as in y open parentheses 1 close parentheses, so let's not get hung up on the indexing. Y number one is secretly just an alias for the u function, and y number two is the derivative of u with respect to theta. Just as in ordinary third semester calculus, we differentiate such a thing one component at a time, but on the other hand, the derivative of y1 with respect to theta is 
to the derivative of y1 with respect to theta, y1 is u, so this first component is just du d theta, but du d theta is another name for 4y2, so the first component of the derivative of y with respect to theta is the second component of the y vector. On the other hand, the derivative of y2 with respect to theta is the derivative of that with respect to theta, but y2 is du d theta. The derivative of that with respect to theta is the second derivative of u with respect to theta. From the differential equation, though, we know the second derivative of u plus u is a, or one of those more complicated functions in other cases. In this particular situation, though, this immediately tells us that the second derivative of u with respect to theta is a minus u, that is to say a minus y1. So the derivative of the vector valued function y is given by this vector. In more general situations, there could be dependencies on theta, on y1, and on y2 in some of these components. Of course, just knowing a differential equation, dy d theta is y2 a minus y1, typically has many solutions, as we've mentioned before. We're going to have to include the initial conditions in some way. For today's discussion, I want to think about the simplest possible method for this situation. So I want to imagine that the derivative of y with respect to theta is some vector-valued function f, which can depend on theta and the components of the y vector. y, when theta equals zero, is known to us. In particular, for our differential equation, we have actual physically meaningful numbers to put in for alpha and beta. What I want to do is I want to find values of the solution vector y for various theta values between zero and some ending theta value that I'll call theta max. If you'll remember from first semester calculus, the machinery that we're going to use will be very familiar to you. It's the same machinery that we used when we defined integration. I'm going to take the range of numbers starting at theta equals zero, ending at theta equals theta max, and I'm going to select some positive whole number n and call delta theta how wide the interval of theta numbers divided by the number of subdivisions that I'm going to use. I'll call theta equals zero theta zero. I call the starting value theta zero even if I was starting at some other value than zero radians. Theta one is delta theta larger than theta zero. Delta two is delta theta larger than theta one and so on. Theta number i is the starting theta value, which in this case is zero, plus i times delta theta. This is true for i equals one, two, three, out to n. The premise of the method that we're going to talk about is this. If I knew the value of y, say at theta zero, which we do, by approximating the derivative in the differential equation in a certain way, we will be able to move forward in theta value and get an estimate for the solution vector y at theta number one. Then we will replace theta zero with theta one and do the same thing again. I'll use the fact that I know 
or have an estimate of the solution vector y at theta 1 to move forward in theta value again. This will give me an estimate for the solution at theta equals theta 2, and we will just continue doing this all the way down until we have an estimate for y at theta equals theta max. So I can imagine evaluating the differential equation at theta number i as a notational thing. I'm going to let w number j represent the approximation to the solution vector y at theta equals theta number j. To get the simplest possible approximation method, I'm just going to take this differential equation I've written on the first line and approximate this derivative. This difference quotient is approximately equal to the derivative of y with respect to theta at theta number i. This is approximately equal to the quantity on the right hand side. To obtain my approximation method, instead of y at theta number i plus 1, I'll write w number i plus 1. Instead of y number i, w number i, and I'll say that this difference quotient of the approximations should equal f at theta i w i. Algebraic rearrangement says then that w i plus 1 is going to be w i plus the spacing in the theta values times f evaluated at theta i w i. This is called Euler's method. It's the simplest of all possible initial value solvers. What I need to know to make this work is the value of theta at a given point and at least an estimate for the solution of the differential equation at that point. If I know, for instance, theta 0 and w 0, then I'll know that. This comes from the setup of the approximation method. We know that, and we know that. By calculating this, this will give me an estimate, starting at theta 0, of the solution at theta equals theta 1 instead. And then I can go around in a loop doing this for as long as I care to. To implement this plan, select a positive integer. Let delta theta be the width of the range of theta values divided by how many subintervals I'm going to divide it into. Theta number i is the smallest theta value, 0 in this case, plus i times delta theta, where i can be 0, 1, 2, and so on, up to n. Vector w number 0 is going to be the initial condition for my initial value problem, and then for i equals 0, 1, 2, 3 to n minus 1, estimate w i plus 1, the estimate of the solution vector at theta number i plus 1, will be the estimate of the solution at theta i plus delta theta times the f vector evaluated at theta i w i. Then we go around and do this again until we run out of indexes. Speaking of the indexes, we start with i equal 0. So initially, this index will be 0, and it will be w number 0 plus 1, w number 1 that we're calculating. The very last i value is n minus 1, the very last w that we calculate will be w number n minus 1 plus 1. That is to say, w number n. This will be the approximation to the solution at theta n 
which is equal to theta max. In the next video, continuing to be slightly off topic, we'll implement this Euler method and see how well it does. The answer is going to be not very well at all, but we will investigate that when we get there. In the meantime, I hope everybody has a good day, and I'll talk to you again soon.